Yes, I know we're moving into dangerous territory here, reviewing a video card that's likely to be as difficult to buy as just about every other one. And a perfectly valid question is this, why should Nvidia release an RTX 3080 Ti if you can't even buy the vanilla 3080? Well, the official explanation is this, different cards come off the production line with different levels of quality and they are binned for different product tiers. 3080, 3090 and now 3080 Ti all use the same GA102 chip, but the processors are graded and allocated to each product line. The official explanation then is that 3080 Ti chips were always reserved to be for 3080 Ti. So in theory then, the more GA102 products out there, the more GPUs there are physically available to buy. So what to make of the 3080 Ti as a product then? Well, first impressions are that, well, physically at least, this is totally identical to the RTX 3080, when looking at the founder's card anyway. It's the same cooler design, the same custom power input, even the same color. Now, we've already seen this once before. Nvidia released a 3060 Ti that's using the same design as 3070, but they did tweak the color scheme. Not so this time. As far as I can tell, the only difference is the Ti logo. Stands to reason, really. After all, it is the same chip inside at the end of the day. However, you can really think of the 3080 Ti as a hybrid product of sorts. The cooler design from the 3080, but a lot more of the internals uh, and the internal design of the 3090. So yeah, let's take a look at the specs table here. If we consider the 3090 as the king of all of the GA102-based GPUs, RTX 3080 Ti has almost 98% of the shading hardware of the so-called BF GPU, dwarfing the equivalent 83% of the RTX 3080. The Ti also gets the full 384-bit memory interface of the 3090 up against the 3080's 320-bit bus. Therefore, there's also quite a big bump to memory bandwidth, a full 20% increase, actually. The reduced amount of CUDA cores compared to 3090 does see a small drop in bandwidth compared to the GPU King, though. Memory? NVIDIA sticks to the top-end TI playbook, halving the Titans, or rather the 90 series, cards allocation. 12 gigs it is, then, of the G6X variety. It's still lacking compared to AMD's 16 gigabytes on its big Navi cards, but only 12 or 24 gig options are effectively available on a 384-bit interface. Boost clock on the new TI is lower than both 3090 and 3080, but the 1665 MHz clock here is, as usual, conservative. Control at 4K ran between 1.7 to 1.8 GHz, Assassin's Creed Valhalla even hit 1.9, but relatively speaking, it looks like it is a touch slower than both 3080 and 3090 here. Power though? Wow, I remember saying that the RTX 3080 was power hungry with its demands for 320 watts. The 3080 Ti matches 3090 spec here at 350. Can the founder's cooler handle it? We had a look at two samples. One was absolutely fine. The other could see fans spin up loudly under load. And I do wonder whether the silicon there wasn't quite of the same grade, requiring more heavy duty cooling. For its part, Nvidia reckons that it's an outlier and that performance should be on par with an RTX 3080, which to be fair, is entirely consistent with the other sample that we looked at. But really, there's not much more to say about the fit and finish of the RTX 3080 Ti. It's familiar territory, really. Internally, it's much closer to a 3090 than a 3080, while on the exterior, well, it speaks for itself, really, doesn't it? I suppose I could talk about MSRPs for a moment, I guess. Uh, $14.99 for the 3090 plays $11.99 for the 3080 Ti. Then there's the $699 RTX 3080. I mean, in terms of price versus performance, and assuming MSRPs or anything close to them were attainable, 3080 is easily the pick of the crop. But both 3080 Ti and 3090 remain the faster products. It's just that even at MSRP, the value is kind of questionable on those super high-end offerings. And I guess that's borne out by the performance data, right? I'm benching at 4K here, though 1440p and 1080p data is available in the Eurogamer review, linked in the video description below. In Doom Eternal here, there's an 11% performance lead for the 3080 Ti over vanilla 3080, while the 3090 hands in a paltry extra percentage point of performance. 
3080 Ti also delivers around an 8-point lead over AMD's 6900 XT. When your minimum frame rates are so high though, it's hard to tell the difference and you'll note that the graph lines on frame time there would require ultra magnification to tell much of a difference. If we look at prior generations though, 3080 Ti is a good 55% faster than 2080 Ti, while the comparisons against 1080 Ti on this title are mind-bending. I guess we should remember that 1080 Ti was much cheaper though back in the day, even inflation adjusted. But even so, 3080, pretty much the same price, and it blitzes it. Borderlands 3 does seem to like compute and to scale with it. 3080 Ti beats 3080 by just over 12%, while the 3090 is faster uh, than the new Ti by around 3 points, which is pretty much the biggest uplift you're going to see between the two highest-end Ampere offerings in rasterization performance. In fact, 6900 XT is being on par with 3090, so 3080 Ti is just a touch slower. For the record, gen-on-gen -gen scalability is still around 55% 2080 Ti to 3080 Ti, but this time the 1080 Ti, the Pascal card, can hold its own a little more effectively. There's a 2.26 multiplier to performance when comparing the new GPU to the old one. Shadow the Tomb Raider, and what I find quite interesting is that these days, the 3080 runs this game as fast as the 3090 did at launch meaning that the 3080 Ti, notionally, sounds faster. Now this sounds odd, right? But that's the benefit of driver revisions. When we re-bench the 3090, it's just under 2% faster, and it's some way ahead of 6900 XT. Gen-on-gen -gen comparisons, a 44% boost to performance over 2080 Ti, and a 2.4 times multiplier to frame rate versus GTX 1080 Ti. Bit of an interesting point though, whatever optimizations were made to the driver weren't just applied to the new Ampere card. I saw similar performance uplifts with 2080 Ti as well. Same thing for Death Stranding, where I've typically referred to it being AMD friendly. That's still the case, but now, via driver optimizations, I noticed that both Turing and Ampere cards now run the game a little better than before. There's a 9 percentage point lead for 3080 Ti over 3080, while 3090 adds a mere 2.7% to the Ti's tally. This puts the high-end GeForce cards effectively on par with AMD's best. I don't have 1080 Ti data for this one, it kept crashing, but the 3080 Ti is 39% faster than the 2080 Ti on this one. Remedies Control next. No new boost to performance via driver optimizations here that I could see and it doesn't really need it. A vanilla 3080 is 10 points to the better over 6900 XT, while 3080 Ti has a 12 point lead over its standard sibling. 3090 comparisons? Well, a 1.7% lead over the Ti, um, outside of the margin of error, but not by much. This is another game where the gen on gen boosts are appreciable though. 3080 Ti is 49% faster than 2080 Ti, founders to founders, and that does include the 2080 Ti's factory overclock. There's a 2.7 times improvement to performance up against 1080 Ti. So look, I think these numbers are quite profound really when you think about it. Pascal cards are the ones most likely to be replaced, right? So the increase to performance there is going to be pretty huge. That said, the 2080 Ti is still a terrific GPU. So I could go on really, but there's not really so much else to tell. A 3080 Ti is typically 9 to 13% faster than the 3080 uh, in rasterization tests, and the 3090 always manages to inch ahead, albeit by very, very small margins. Performance differentials up against the AMD RX 6900 XT vary, but it's always there or thereabouts in most of our tests, and it's notionally cheaper, of course but it's not really comparable when it comes to ray tracing performance, where AMD is far further back in development than Nvidia, and where basically all of the available games were optimized on GeForce hardware. Benching at 1440p here with no smart upscaling techniques in play, Battlefield 5, which is pretty heavy with RT reflections, shows just a seven point lead for 3080 Ti over 3080, while 3090 is a couple of points to the better against the new Ti offering. Even with resizable bar active on AMD and inactive on Nvidia, 3080 Ti is still 30.5% faster. With rebar off on both, the gap extends to 45%. Metro Exodus, a curious one this. 
Again, just a seven point lead for 3080 Ti over 3080, while the 3090 still commands a larger than average advantage, 6.7% in my tests. Again, AMD is far behind here with 3080 Ti outpointing it by 37%. I should stress that this is the non-enhanced version of Exodus. We'll be updating our test bench suite in the fullness of time. Finally, control. Again, I see the 3090 punching above its weight uh, compared to rasterized performance with the BF GPU delivering a six point lead over the 3080 Ti. And again, the Ti is just seven percentage points ahead of the vanilla 3080. So this is kind of curious as pretty much all of the ray tracing tests see the Ti sit between the standard 3080 and 3090, not skewed towards the higher end offering as we see in rasterization analysis. We'll end the performance test with a quick look at resizable bar. All of the tests we've seen so far have been with this off on both Nvidia and AMD hardware. Now resizable bar is only available with some motherboard and CPU combinations. Effectively rebar allows the CPU to address GPU memory far more efficiently and this can produce some impressive performance wins. Now I didn't look at this in a huge amount of depth but Assassin's Creed Valhalla is interesting at both 4K and 1440p resolutions, I charted a 5.5% lead with rebar active. This would likely rise at 1080p, but come on, I find the concept of extreme GPUs running at full HD to be kind of ridiculous. Borderlands 3 was interesting. I saw much more instability in benchmark runs with rebar active, and you can see the stutter on the frame time graphs there. And while this stutter can intrude into the benchmark when rebar isn't active, I simply couldn't get rid of it when it was enabled. Run after run, I'd still see the same stutters. There's no real win at 4K with rebar active and only a 3.4 percentage point lead at 1440p. Finally, control. This does seem to be on the list of supported titles, but I actually saw a regression in performance here, like seven or 8%. So yeah, not recommended for this title. Now I'm gonna add a gigantic caveat to these results by saying that I'm using an Intel CPU, Core i9-10900K with an ASUS board that does allow for resizable bar. Typically Ryzen 5000 seems to be used for benchmarks and I note that even Nvidia itself now uses a Ryzen setup for benchmarking in its own reviewer's guide. So maybe it's my system that's not optimal here. But yeah, I guess that's everything I've got to say about 3080 Ti performance in detail. And with that being the case, let's round everything up then. There are a few surprises really with the RTX 3080 Ti. It treads the path of prior Ti releases, this time nipping and tucking at 90 series spec, as opposed to what would have previously been called a Titan. You lose a few shaders, you half the RAM, but you still get broadly equivalent performance overall. How equivalent? Well, the 3090 is between one to 3% faster in our rasterization tests and around six to 7% faster with ray tracing. This is entirely consistent on the rasterization side, at least with the old Titan versus TI differentials, right? Thing is, the situation is different this time. Now, the non-TI 80 class product is using the exact same chip as the absolute top end offerings. It's something we've not seen since GTX 780, 780 Ti and the original Titan. And what that means is that the gap between RTX 3080 and its far more expensive siblings is much tighter than it was between 2080 and 2080 Ti. The circa 25 to 35 percentage point difference is now more like 9 to 13 percent on average. And it can even be lower on games with traditionally poor scalability like Assassin's Creed Odyssey here, benched at 4K. Meanwhile, the gap in memory allocation has also narrowed. The three gigabyte increase seen between 10 series and 20 series 80 cards compared to their TI counterparts is now two gigabytes instead. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion that you're getting the lion's share of the experience with the standard 3080. Meanwhile, for high-end content creators, well, Personally speaking, you'd have to prize the 24 GB RTX 3090 or indeed the older Titan RTX out of my cold, dead hands before I'd trade it for a 12 gig card. When it comes to high-end 4K production or just insanely complex Premiere timelines in general, video memory is king. Ultimately, what you're left with then is a Halo product that's 
got more in common with the extreme offerings of old, a relatively small amount of extra performance for a whole lot more money. If this were a sane world where GPUs could be bought at MSRP, I think it's fair to say that AMD would still be in the game with 6900 XT. I think overall 3080 Ti is on par or faster, but really it's the ray tracing support and DLSS that would justify the extra money in comparison to that. Thing is, well DLSS kind of makes the case for the standard 3080 even stronger. I guess 3080 Ti is indeed more of a Halo product. The 3090 is great for content creation at the high end, but for this generation at least, value in the gaming space is skewed much more towards the 80 part. But that's all from me for now, so yeah, please do like, subscribe, share. You know the score. And of course, we've got a bell, and it's there to be rung if you're already subscribed. Doing so opens the door to something both remarkable and astonishing. Instant notifications when we have a new video for you. As for the DF Supporter program, it's the full, fat Digital Foundry experience. Bonus videos, behind the scenes stuff, early access, full on DF Retro, a close relationship between the team and our supporters. We're proud of it, we're proud of the community we're building and I invite you to partake. Plus of course, there's still the pristine quality video downloads of everything we do. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.